Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Docker 101, Introduction to Docker. A few housekeeping items before we get started. As a reminder, this session is being recorded, and a copy of the recording will be sent out a few days after the webinar. We will also take questions at the end, so please post them in the Q&A window located in the lower right of your screen, and our speaker will address them at the end of the session. Now I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Jenny Fong, Director, Product Marketing at Docker. Jenny, I will now turn things over to you. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Great, so thanks everybody for joining us today. My name is Jenny Song. Um, you can follow me at Tech Gal Jenny. And today what we're gonna talk about is the basics of Docker and Docker containers. Um, so what I've got planned is we're first to set up the stage on, on the market context. Why have containers um, been rapidly adopted across major organizations? Why now? Um, and then we're going into the basics. So what is a container? What does it look like? How does it run? And from there we'll go into, if you progress with containers, how do you run Docker in production? Um, and then finally, I'll close with a few steps to help you get started with Docker. So let's go ahead and get started. So Docker is the leading software container platform. It was at originally founded in 2013. Um, the concept of Linux containers isn't brand new, but what Docker did is made it fundamentally easier to use and it addressed a lot of the key challenges that developers were initially having around uh, agility. So one of the key benefits coming out of that initial um, innovation is that Docker has helped solve what we call the works on my machine problem. So if we take in a developer who's building something on their laptop and move that into test and QA and then into pre-production and production, uh, what we used to see is a lot of different uh, compatibility issues that would cause something that was working in one environment to break down in another environment. Uh, so containers solved a lot of key problems on the developer side. Uh, and as that maturity has grown, we've seen the ability of containers to address a lot of other different IT issues and challenges. So I always like to say today we're in this era of digital transformation where all industries, banking, real estate, retail, manufacturing, everybody is looking at how they can uh, leverage the digital economy and, and realize the importance of having modern experiences for their customers, and that general transformation is coming from a lot of different angles. Um, in this diagram, the first one is application modernization. So organizations are looking at how do they take all of their traditional monolithic applications built, you know, in the 90s and in the last uh, decade and modernize them for this new digital economy. Um, separately from that, organizations look at what their cloud strategy is going to be, and that could be a mix of adopting public cloud, making sure that they can run a hybrid or multi-cloud um, environment, and the benefits that cloud brings to organizations. And then finally, DevOps practices. So this is a process around continuous integration and continuous delivery for accelerating how a company uh, brings a new concept to production. So within these three uh, initiatives, I would say every CIO and major organization um, has investments in these areas, and it really is being a key factor of why uh, containers are becoming ubiquitous across uh, all environments and all industries. Now, when we look at the fundamental challenges that organizations have, it's that we are in this transition where there are different and diverse technologies that, that you have to deal with. Um, there's, you know, running in a physical environment, running in a virtual environment, running things in your own data centers or at least the data center or in the public cloud. Um, most organizations are going to have a mix of Linux and Windows workloads. 
and a mix of traditional monolithic applications as well as investment in these new microservices-based applications. In general, this is just a lot of diversity that our organizations have to deal with. And on top of that, they have the sort of ongoing tug of war between developers and IT operations. Um, they, these groups often uh, do work well together but have conflicting interests. Uh, so if you think about a developer, they are wanting to be able to code and, and ship quickly while IT really wants to ship securely and, and ensure high availability in the design. So they have different uh, motivating factors in terms of their priorities, which generates a difficult tug of war between those two organizations. Because of the diversity that companies are facing, what ends up happening is in this transition, um, our customers often hear that they should be operating as two different organizations. Um, and this is what sometimes is called the bimodal IT model. There's a, a group that focuses on the existing applications, traditional applications, and running on traditional servers and environments. Uh, and there's teams that focus on these net new microservices-based applications running in the public cloud. Uh, and so what we hear is from customers that, you know, they're looking at building an organization that has these two different teams, this bimodal structure. But in reality, what we know is customers all want to just have one mode, which is fast. Uh, it means being fast in how we innovate, fast in how we handle our traditional existing application portfolio. Um, it means being fast in how we develop, fast in how we move from development to production. And that's really the space where we see the opportunity for containers, which is the ability to help customers run any type of application, whether it's microservices or traditional, whether it's Linux or apps uh, or Windows, and run those applications on any infrastructure. So on your, uh, you know, traditional big servers and hyperconverged infrastructure in the public cloud, um, and making all of this. Uh, agile, scalable, portable, and easy to patch and update. So that is the market context. That's the opportunity for uh, containers. So let's go into what exactly a container is. So to do that, it's best to kind of go into our time machine and travel back to how things were and, and what's possible today. So let's start with, you know, the initial foray into um, applications, which is there was one app per server, uh, per physical server. So an application was developed maybe on uh, WebSphere or WebLogic, maybe it was a .NET application, um, and it was running on a host operating system, running on a physical server. It was a one-to-one -one ratio, which has a lot of different limitations. One of them is that server technology kept improving. Um, we talk about Moore's Law and the uh, chips getting more and more powerful. And what ended up happening is you might have a small application running on a large physical server, which is a lot of wasted utilization. So there's a lot of wasted resources. But the fact of bringing up a physical server on demand uh, is, you know, it's a multi-day process. So procurement, installation, configuration, all of that took a lot of time. Um, and what that meant is that organizations, when they have a new project, would, would, would not be able to even start hosting a new application for several days or weeks or even months uh, because of that challenge. So in comes virtualization. So virtualization really booms in, you know, 2000s and it, has the fundamental benefit of allowing you to divide a physical server resources into individual isolated virtual machines. And each virtual machine um, doesn't really see them as being sharing resources. They, they think they own the, the entire server. Uh, and each virtual machine has its own uh, guest operating system as well as the application loaded on that. So immediate benefits there, better resource pooling, you go from a one-to-one -one ratio to eight-to-one, ten-to-one, um, so the immediate savings and, and consolidation uh, is, plays into a large fact of the rapid adoption of virtualization. Uh, virtualization also helps 
to create the public cloud market. Because in the end, if you think about what Amazon or Azure is, uh, it is a virtual machine for rent. Uh, so this technology provides, again, that, that pure ability to uh, improve scale and efficiency. But there is still a little bit of challenges here, which is that when you create a virtual machine, you are still creating a full uh, copy of a environment. So again, the virtual machine is an application loaded on a full operating system, has full CPU allocation, storage, and RAM associated with it. Now let's talk about that small application again. If you have a small application doing something very basic, but loading it on an entire host operating system, again, you're going to have some wasted resources. Um, the, one of the benefits I forgot to mention with virtualization in this model is that each of the virtual machines can run a different guest operating system. So you can have Linux and Windows on the same host. But the downside of that is an application loaded on one virtual machine uh, in a certain operating system may not run in another virtual machine and a different operating system. So the application portability across different infrastructure and different platforms is not guaranteed. A great example of that is trying to move a vSphere-based virtual machine into a public cloud environment like Amazon, which is actually based on a Zen hypervisor, and, and Azure, which is based on a Hyper-V hypervisor. So those raw virtual machine formats are not, in, are not compatible, which means that in order to move a virtual machine to the public cloud, you will have to do some conversion factor on the workload. So that's some of the, the you know, benefits and, and limitations of virtualization. Uh, so in comes containers. So what is a container? Uh, it's a, a, a standard way of packaging software and their dependencies. Um, and in one way, if you think about virtualization as the abstraction of, of infrastructure, uh, containers are an abstraction of applications and, and the software on top of the infrastructure. When you containerize an application in the similar vein as, as virtual, virtualization, you create isolated applications. Uh, but they can share the same OS kernel, and this is something that plays into some of the key benefits of containers, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. Docker was the first to really standardize the format of container runtime, and it was, became widely adopted, um, and Docker continues to be the leading platform for containerizing Windows applications. So Windows-based and Linux applications can all uh, run Dockerized containers. So let's look at a little bit about uh, the difference between containers and virtual machines. So if you look on this first uh, diagram, a container actually runs on the Docker engine, which is installed on a host operating system. So Docker always does require a host OS. Uh, and is installed on top of that. That's in comparison to virtualization, which runs on bare metal. So Docker Engine runs on the host OS and allows you to create multiple containers that can all run in that same host OS. Now you compare that diagram to virtual machines, and again, we see that the hypervisor runs on the infrastructure directly, and you have full copies of, a, of an operating system for different virtual machines. Now, does that mean that the two solutions are incompatible? No. And in fact, containers and VMs work very well together. Um, if you look on the left, this is a uh, Docker running on bare metal on some host operating system with different co um, containers running on top of that. And on the right, we have Docker running on a guest OS inside a virtual machine running different containers. And so again, they do work very well together, but they are implemented at a different layer. And so a term that we're gonna talk about um, in a few slides is something called um, nodes. And so when we talk about nodes, we are talking about either a physical node, which is this on the left, or a virtual node, which is this on the right. And to Docker, they're equivalent in the sense that we don't really care if you manage or run your Docker engine 
in a physical node or a virtual node. Um, it really just depends on your needs and, and what you prefer. Uh, another aspect of this diagram to note is that you can run containers side by side on standard virtual machines because again, virtualization provides the uh, isolation between things. Um, I'm hearing some comments about the audio. So Melanie, is, it, is, is there something that we can try to fix on the audio or I'll try moving around and hopefully that will solve some of the problems? Yes, hi Jenny. Um, I think it's each individual. Um, a couple of people are trying to call in through their computers and I'm trying to direct them to call into on landlines or cell phones. So I've been chatting with folks throughout it with some audio fixes. Okay, so I'm coming in okay though for you? Yes, you're absolutely coming in. I think it's individual um, issues with um, users, the way users have called in or set up. So I'm, I'm speaking with each of those individually. Okay, great. I will keep going. All right, so that's the fundamental kind of uh, structure of a container. The, ish, the interesting dynamics of how containers share a guest operating system really help bring out some of the benefits of containers that we'll, we'll get into. So part of what a running container depends on is an image. So if you think about an image is a blueprint for a container runtime. So the container itself is something that is um, actively in operation or online, whereas the image is a static file that tells the container what's happening. Understanding the image layers um, helps to really explain the value of uh, container technology and, and how that benefits users. So a Docker image is made up of different file systems that are layered on top of each other. So in this diagram, you can see how each image consists of multiple layers, and each layer is just another image. So uh, it's a little bit of a, uh, think of it as like Lego stack um, of building an application. Uh, where this comes into play, or, or let's take a closer look at this one. So you see the base image here is the Debian image, and then we have different file systems that are mounted on top of that base image as read-only um, pieces. And then the last piece is the writable containers. These are the differences between the base images. So what that really means, and, and this might be a little bit of an abstract concept, but this next slide may help you understand is that when we build containers, we can share base images that have the same underlying platform. So in this example, we have one host OS, which is Ubuntu-based. Uh, we stack layers of either Java or Nginx here. You stack another layer of Apache Tomcat, and you can run all of these different containers on the shared layer. What that means is every time if we're looking at these top four boxes on the left, every time I deploy one of these applications or the, one of these containers, I don't have to redeploy a full stack. So in a virtual machine, you would have to load Ubuntu, load Java, load Apache, load Maven, then the app. Because we're sharing these layers, as long as this, these have already been loaded in our system, the next container will just reuse those pieces. Um, and so that really cuts down in the disk space and memory usage and it makes it a lot faster to boot up a new container which already is leveraging these. So that's one of the key benefits of the container technology um, is that ability to share these layers. And so in order to help really demonstrate this, uh, let's do a quick demo. So what I'm gonna actually do is run a local uh, Docker on Mac here uh, this is installed in my laptop, and you know what, I'm going to increase the font so everybody can see. Okay, so this is uh, my laptop. Uh, I have Docker for Mac installed, and what I'm going to do, actually I need to go a little bit down so I can get there, is share the version. So what you see is I've got 1706. Community Edition, that's what CE stands for, and we'll talk a little bit about that, running on my local Mac. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull an image from a public repository. So an image, again, is the 
blueprint to a container. And I'm going to, oh, you know what? I just realized I'm not sharing my full screen. Thank you for the folks who are keeping me honest here. There we go. So, unfortunately, you missed the step, so I'm, I'll just pull um, a different image <laughs> uh, so that you guys can see it. So, what is happening is there's a repository, and you can either have public repositories or private repositories, and then you can pull different images down from uh, the repository. So, I'm going to now pull a different image just so you guys can see this. Now, what a couple of things you'll see is this is coming from public repository. It'll always look for the latest unless you specify a different version. So what's happening now is I'm pulling an image of Ubuntu from a predefined library. So right now, uh, you saw that pull was complete. Now I'm going to show you all the images that are on my local laptop. So these are all the different images I've got already downloaded. I've got Ubuntu 12.04, because that was one time where I specified the version. This time I just said latest, that's the default. Um, I have some other things here. So that is all, these are all the images that are running, uh, that are saved into my local environment. Um, now I'm gonna do a container LS, just to show you, I don't have anything actually running. These are again, just blueprints. So what does it actually look like to? instantiate a container or run a container, um, what we're going to do is a very simple web static site. And this comes straight from our, one of our training environments. And so uh, I'll, I'll point you guys to where this location is. But in order to do this demo, what I'm going to show you guys real fast is right now, there's nothing in my local host, right? I'm refreshed, nothing's there. So. Let's now run a container. And how we do that is with a run command, I'm going to do a couple of um, uh, extensions to this. So dash D means we want it to run in the background detached. Dash P is I want to connect it to my ports. So I'm going to expose this to my ports and I'm going to run it with AD80. I'm going to name this my web app, and uh, the image that this, oops, I forgot to give it a name. So I'm going to call this name web app, my web app, but it's going to be based on an image that I already pulled. So it's going to be based on this particular image. So the key is I'm going to press enter on this, and I want you guys to see how fast it is to get up and running. Uh, whoops, uh, Oops. I have a typo, that's my fault. So now I press return and there, it's already online. So you compare that to the instantiation speed of a virtual machine and that's what one of the key um, advantages of Docker containers is, it's really the speed. So now I do container LS and you see that I have a running my web app this is the container ID, which I will need shortly. So how do I prove that it's online? Refresh, hello Docker. So this is just kind of a hello world application, super simple, uh, something you guys can all do on your laptops if you download Docker for Mac today. So I mentioned you can also access these exercises. Uh, we have, excuse me, training.docker.com. If you go to self-paced exercises, uh, we have a lot of getting started for developers and for IT pros. Um, here is, there's some basics, uh, hello world, developing simple web apps, that's the one I just did. One other aspect that you can do within the site is uh, if you don't want to download Docker for Mac, but I really do highly recommend it, or Docker for Windows or Docker for Linux, whatever your workstation is, it's super simple and free, uh, but we also have this emulated environment, which gives you a lot of the same capabilities. So I'm in the emulated environment, and I can run the same commands I just did, right? So uh, highly recommend everybody who's learning to, to go to these sites. So let's see. Just a couple more things I'll do is I will now um, 
stop this particular container. Oh, I had already copied it. Uh, which will keep it, uh, we'll turn it off, and then we can also remove it um, after that. But that was just a real quick basic demonstration to let you guys see how a uh, basic container runtime works. Going back to the slides. So as we saw, uh, the key benefits of Docker containers, one is speed, so there's no operating system to boot. Your applications are online in seconds. It's highly portable, and uh, this is based on the layers that we talked about. So if you think about uh, each layer can be updated individually, and the, uh, we can actually move Docker containers from one platform to another con platform based on an image um, and not worry about compatibility issues. And so this means that a workload that you deploy on-prem in your x86 server will be easily portable to running in an Azure or Amazon cloud. Lot, the last thing I wanted to point out was efficiency. It's a little hard to see that in my example, but uh, when we do have those shared layers, we do save a lot on general efficiency. Okay. So that was basically kind of the start of the Docker technology. It's what developers really got uh, jumped down to in terms of seeing the benefits of being able to do this. So imagine um, the example I just showed you. I, I'm, I'm a developer working on my laptop. I can code, push, and ship really quickly in my laptop locally, um, which accelerates my development speed. Now, let's start thinking about what happens when you want to start moving this into production. So IT operations can do the same thing. They can install Docker for uh, Windows Server or Docker for Red Hat Enterprise Linux in different environments. Uh, and that's what we do. We start with that secure base uh, and continuize our applications. We run Docker on our developers' laptops. We run Docker in our production environment. But that really is just sort of an incomplete picture because what's key for running Docker in production is how you connect those two environments. How do we move a image from a developer's laptop through to the IT team who has to operate that and needs to manage the security of it, manage the life cycle of it, making sure that uh, different containers don't talk to each other, different containers can talk to each other. So what we discussed is the uh, building a secure software supply chain, which is how do we connect what a developer is doing to what IT is doing and this is what we call a container as a service architecture. So this is a pretty complex picture. I'm going to break it down into a couple of parts. So let's start with um, the developer's point of view. Again, I kind of showed you that experience, which is running Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows and turns my laptop into a local Docker host. So this gives the developer the ability to run local containers and to do all their uh, coding work uh, locally. We talk about images being the foundation of containers. So the image has to be stored in some sort of repository. Um, now these repositories are, can be either public or private. Um, and in most organizations running Docker in production, they're going to want a private repository, something where uh, there is not access to those images uh, by others. Now, developers will push and pull images uh, from uh, between the registry, and uh, the registry can be hosted either locally, meaning on your own servers or in a cloud service like Amazon. Uh, and the Docker Trusted Registry, again, the enterprise grade private registry uh, is included in our enterprise edition standard and advanced. So if a developer wants to push a new update to an application, what they would do is pull the current image from the registry and then make changes to it and push it back to the registry. So. Once a image has been blessed as this is the image I want to push into deployment, uh, that's when we IT can take over and take that 
uh, choose the best location to run those containers. And that can be a mix of pre-production or production environments, and that can be inside the data center or in the cloud. So these environments can be a single Docker host, uh, but more often it is a cluster of Docker hosts, which we call, uh, which are running in swan mode orchestrated clusters. So in order to manage these clusters and the containers running on them, um, they'll want to work through some sort of control plane that provides visibility into the environment. And so the control plane, uh, which we'll take a look at in a minute, is also included with Docker Enterprise Edition. So that is the Docker Containers as a Service architecture. Uh, but again, I think the best way to highlight what this is is to do another, oh, um, let me pull out a, a couple of things that I said here. So if you think about the difference between running Docker for developers and versus running Docker in production, um, what you see is that, you know, the container engine is one piece of it. That's what I showed you running Docker for Mac is the container engine. It does include orchestration. It includes how, you know, to uh, connect it to my, the ports on my laptop, et cetera. But when we talk about running in production, what we really do want to focus on is that entire life cycle. When we talk about the integrated life cycle management, we're talking about Docker Enterprise Edition, so the CAS-enabled platform for both developers and IT. Um, one aspect of that that is pretty key is how we have certified partners to work with our enterprise solution. Um, these partners are either infrastructure platforms like AWS, like Windows Server, or they can be certified containers. Uh, these are containers provided by vendors and ISVs like Oracle. Uh, there's a set of Oracle database containers that you can download from the Docker store. Uh, there's also a set of Docker certified plugins. These plugins are, uh, are what allow you to uh, plug in different capabilities like logging, monitoring, um, uh, storage, and, and um, other aspects of, uh, surrounding the platform. So here's just a quick list of what you can find in our Docker store today uh, with different, again, containers, plugins, and infrastructure. All of these are validated for quality and to work with our enterprise edition, uh, as well as having joint support uh, contracts with all these partners to ensure that if you do have any issues, you will be able to get support from us and the vendor or the partner. So now I will jump into the demo. So for this demo, what I'm going to show you is a, um, oh no, I, I think I closed the window, so give me one second. I'm gonna load it up again. Uh, I apologize, I had it open, I must have accidentally closed it. So what I'm gonna be logging into is a, a new environment that we have for people to trial Docker Enterprise Edition. And again, remember Enterprise Edition and, and how it's different is that uh, Enterprise Edition includes uh, both the private registry solution as well as a universal control plane for managing your environment. And so now I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go. So uh, we will be making this trial environment available to customers. Uh, it's hosted so that you don't have to actually install or configure Docker Enterprise Edition in, in any of your own hosts. Um, you, what you do is you get a four hour lease into this environment and you can play around with it. So as I mentioned, so there's kind of two key pieces available in Enterprise Edition, the universal control plane for managing it and Docker Trusted Registry, which is for the, the image repository. I'm gonna shrink this down so you guys can see a bit more of this. Um, there's also an admin console, which is just like what I showed you with Docker for Mac. So again, I can do this. So right here, we're running 1703 EE, the Enterprise Edition, in this particular trial environment. There's also a guide of steps we're learning more about Docker, so when you get access to this environment, you'll be able to run through some exercises. For now, let me just walk you through a few of the key kind of views here. And what you see first is the dashboard. This is just, you know, what is happening in my Docker environment. 
Um, actually, let me start with the trusted registry. I have a couple of different images that are already here um, that have been preloaded for me. Um, what I can do in the console is similar to what I did on my laptop. I can pull image um, from our public repository, and I am sorry, I forgot. Cool. So that's downloading, and while that's downloading, I will go back to the view of Docker Trusted Registry, and you'll see that this will show up here. So this is the UI that the IT operators can use to manage uh, the registry. The key to managing the registry is the permissions and allocations as well as the policies behind them. So for example, I may have different teams that should have different app, uh, access to different repositories. I can create new teams or new organizations and then assign them access to different repositories. And then within the repository itself, there's a couple of good uh, security enhancements that we've added to uh, ensure that Docker running in production is secure for your organization. One is um, the, what you see here. We have a concept of called image signing and image scanning. So image scanning is look, comparing your image that you've checked into this repository against a list of known vulnerabilities um, that come from the NIST CVE database. So you scan an image and it compares it against the, NIST, the, the list and lets you know if there are different critical and major and minor issues. So if I view the details, I can go into it more. So you see that in this particular image where we have a couple of different components, um, BusyBox, for example, has a critical and a major inside this component. And here you can see these are the specific CVEs that uh, are at issue. So before um, IT even runs this image in any environment, they can run these scans and only clear the images that are clean to be run in production. So it's one of the ways that we ensure that the, the security of the containers are, or they're patched appropriately, that they're using the latest patches, et cetera. So that's one of the key aspects within image registry, um, access control as well as repositories. In the universal control plane, we can start looking at what's actually running. So here we have the containers that are actually running. Uh, we had different ones that have been turned on before. Um, you can get details on each of these in terms of what resources it's, it's leveraging, et cetera. Uh, you can also look at the different networks that are available that have been created. Um, Docker leverages fully, uh, you know, software-defined networks. Uh, there's built-in HTTP routing mesh or overlay networking that you can uh, leverage so that containers can talk to each other, uh, all software-defined. Your storage volumes, and then secrets. So secrets are passwords for the actual containers, um, and it's another way to validate who is, has access to a container and who's running them. Um, another key security capability for our customers. Okay, that is just a brief walkthrough of Dr. EE. E. I'm gonna jump back into the slides. So what I just showed you is um, Docker Enterprise Edition Advanced, which includes the trusted registry, the private registry, the universal control plane, as well as the basic engine. Um, and so how you actually deploy this and how this directory is uh, installed and configured is we have um, the first group is a set of UCP managers. So if you consider uh, the node discussion I brought up, so node to Docker can be a virtual machine or a physical host. Uh, in order to get a highly available infrastructure online, um, we recommend at least three UCP nodes, uh, which carry a copy of the, the entire cluster setting. Uh, but this is really, you can do three nodes, five nodes, seven nodes, it just depends on, you know, your failure tolerance uh, inside your organization. So the UCB 
nodes um, communicate each other through a RAS consensus group. That's the technology for uh, building a swarm-based cluster and have an internal distributed store that that is that kind of holds the the map of your entire environment. So the UCP managers talk to the UCP worker nodes. Now these are the actual host nodes that run the containers themselves. Um, you can have any number of host UCP worker nodes um, and then the containers themselves are deployed onto there. When we talk about swarm orchestration, one of the key things is defining rules and constraints on what containers can run on which UCP workers. And so there may be different rules based on networking or, uh, you know, different security implementations, different teams that need different access. Uh, so those are all defined through the constraints and rules of the orchestration engine. Setting up the Docker Trusted Registry, we actually have the DTR installed on UCP worker nodes. So we take some of the worker nodes and turn them into the DTR registry. And again, for high availability, we do recommend at least three um, so that you have a copy of your registry across all of uh, as many failure points as you, as you can tolerate. So again, the developers will push and pull images from that private registry, um, set up the rules and, and manage them through the UCP, and then they run on uh, the UCP worker nodes. So again, there's uh, additional tooling that you can add to this based on our partners and, and the certified partners that we have around logging, monitoring, and even um, storage. So I talked about the demo environment was Docker EE Advanced. Uh, we also have Docker EE Basic and Standard. In order to get the private registry as well as the universal control plane and the, the GUI based management, those are in standard and advanced. Um, EE Basic provides you the certified un, um, partners, so the certified infrastructure, certified plugins. Uh, but for those other aspects, you will need standard and advanced. And right now, with advanced, you also get that security scanning capability. So the solution that we've been talking about, Docker Enterprise, has been widely adopted across a lot of industries and verticals and a lot of big name customers that you can see here. Um, it is a way to really bring some of the benefits that we talked about of, of containers themselves, the efficiencies, the portability, and other um, operational advantages and apply them across a broad set of applications. And so what I wanted to do is just spend a few minutes to, to go deeper into two of our customers. Um, both of them spoke at DockerCon US, which was in April of this year. Um, and so the first one I'll talk about is MetLife. So many of you know MetLife is a uh, global insurance organization. It's been around for 150 years. Uh, like many other large organizations, they have a lot of legacies. They have a lot of old applications, or, uh, and in their case, what they call systems of record, which go all the way back to the 80s and 90s. They're based on mainframe technology. Um, and so like a lot of different organizations, they're struggling with how do we modernize uh, and provide our customers and our agents a modern experience when all of the actual data sits in systems that are over 30 years old. Um, they also like to point out in their talk, you know, MetLife isn't, you know, uh, Netflix or it isn't, you know, some of these web first type organizations. It is a large, slower enterprise organization. But uh, when they adopted containers and adopted Docker Enterprise Edition, uh, they were able to provide that modern experience to their insurance applications by wrapping microservices applications around those traditional apps and then managing and offering these with Docker Enterprise Edition. Um, some of the very impressive stats was they were able to go from concept to production in only five months. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that can be uh, done so quickly and then some of the things that we have to help you there. Uh, 
Um, but the other aspect of this is it opens the door for broader cloud adoption. So again, because of the, the raw portability you get from containerizing an application, uh, it makes it much easier to consider taking these traditional apps and moving them to a cloud um, versus the, the challenges that, of doing so with uh, traditional virtual format or, or physical format. After containerizing a broad set of applications, they saw a huge uh, improvement in the consolidation of their virtual machines. Um, this goes back to the resource efficiency and sharing the operating system across different containers and sharing different application layers across multiple containers. So they saw a huge resource utilization increase um, and then they were able to do more automation um, because of the way that uh, all Docker containers are based on images. Uh, we didn't go into this deeply, but I, I would recommend uh, doing some more learning after this around how Docker changes the way you can patch, uh, which is based on updating an image rather than patching the, the run time itself. Um, and so some of those key enhancements really help an organization like NetLife uh, scale and manage some of that legacy. Another story is Cornell University. Um, Cornell, which is similar to a lot of large organizations in that they're very distributed across different colleges. So you place that college's concept with business units and, and you can see that uh, it does uh, ring true to a lot of organizations that are distributed like that. Now, Cornell has a broad cloud strategy that they're trying to adopt, which is around moving more and more workloads into public cloud, maintaining them less in their own data centers. To do this, they see Docker Enterprise Edition as a way to both centralize uh, operations as well as get everybody on board. Uh, it, because it works so well with all different types of applications, um, they run, you know, research workloads that are based on the newest, latest, greatest technologies, but they also run a lot of traditional workloads as well. And so Docker EE became a, a centralized environment for them uh, to m make this broader move into the cloud. Um, I'll highlight a couple of specific projects that they did. So one was they had a uh, internal wiki based on Confluence that was really, really out of date, uh, partly because they had so many customizations built into their deployment that it became harder and harder for new team members and people who leave the organization don't, you know, document everything well. So it became really hard for them to actually patch that application and it became a, a chore that people didn't want to do it. Um, with containerizing that app, they were able to really, uh, immediately see benefits in terms of a 10x decrease in time in maintaining that particular application. They also see that instead of patching, you know, haphazardly, maybe once every 12 to 16 months, they are now able to patch on a monthly basis. Uh, another key benefit for them is they, when they bring on board new developers, it used to be a huge on onboarding on-ramp time uh, because the developers had to adhere to these really, you know, complex 10-page setups. Now with containers, it's all standardized across the board uh, and the new developers are able to actually push things into production day one uh, with that, that technology adopted. So in general, uh, you know, across our customer base, we see uh, rapid improvement in software releases, uh, customers who are able to ship more often. Um, we see a reduction in developer onboarding time, as we just said. Uh, we see that massive reduction in the resource footprint, uh, either in the number of virtual machines needed or the number of cores needed. Uh, the, the fundamental portability problems go away. Uh, and with the patching improvements that I mentioned, we are able to see customers respond more rapidly to issues. So the re reduction in the mean time to resolution for any out, uh, issues with running containers, as well as uh, the, the cost reduction of maintaining. So to get started with Docker, if you're uh, interested in learning more, you know, what we see often is customers look at 
containers first as a way to manage their traditional applications and to start being able to take those traditional applications and modernize them. So this is what MetLife did. They started to peel off bits and pieces of their traditional monolithic app, transform those bits and pieces into microservices. Um, and so what we recommend for everyone is like to consider their uh, Docker as a way to modernize their their existing application portfolio while also investing in modernization overall. To help customers out, we have this program, uh, the Modernized Traditional Apps Program. You'll hear us call it the MTA program. Uh, this is a combined program that we deliver in partnership with Microsoft, Avanade, HPE, and Cisco, uh, where we uh, will work with you to actually containerize an application that you have. Uh, we will help you get Docker E installed and configured. Um, it's a 30-day program, and as we've developed this program, what we've seen is we're able to usually get the first application containerized within one to three days, um, and then the rest of the consulting period is really about uh, containerizing larger portions of the portfolio. So this is a great program to help you onboard into the benefits of containers and with Docker Enterprise Edition. Um, and there'll be a lot more other webinars and content around this, so keep your eyes open for that. And then finally, here are a couple of links that may help you. Um, this, dot, uh, this whole presentation will be shared out, so you'll have access to all these links. I showed you guys Play With Docker, uh, which is that emulated environment. You can actually download a free trial of Docker EE. And keep your eyes out for when we launch the hosted environment, uh, which is happening very shortly. Okay, with that, let me get to questions. And I, and I realize there may be many, so let me get to Q&A. Okay, so. Um, the first few, okay, are audio issues. <laughs> yeah, you see the first few there. I tried to assign some to you, um, Jenny, that were okay. um, specific questions. Um, let's see if you're seeing those. Yep, I see them now. So Docker is a hypervisor? No, Docker is not a hypervisor. It is installed on top of a host operating system. So it is actually installed inside your Linux environment or in your Windows Server environment. Um, I mentioned Docker partnered with Windows to get native Docker container support in Windows Server. So we, we are really the only container technology that is running uh, in Windows Server. Is the base image reused at image build time or at runtime? At runtime. So it, once it's been so it's basically like it's a, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a better way to explain it. So Docker uses copy on write, which means that every instance of your image uses the same file until one of them needs to be different. So if there's a layer that needs, it needs to be different, then at that point it copies the file and creates its own version. So that's, um, so an image, uh, yeah, so, and then I'm trying to think of another way to explain that. Um, so this means that the Docker image will not need to write anything to disk to spawn its process. Uh, so that's why we're able to get that speed advantage. Is there any performance degradation due to the extra operating system? Um, no, uh, and there is some things around sizing that it's going to get uh, difficult to talk about here. So if you are installing a Docker engine on a virtual machine, you know, making sure that that virtual machine has the right resources for the volume of containers you expect to run. That is a, a, a practice that you'll have to um, go through. But it'll be a little difficult to explain that all here. Uh, definitely something to stay tuned on for further webinars. Um, in my Docker for Mac demo, I did a, a dash P8080. What it is, is a, so each of the Docker editions, so Docker for Mac, Docker for Windows, Docker for AWS, they're specifically tuned 
for the underlying platform. So in the case of Docker for Mac, um, it has a, it's, it's booted up as like a, a virtual machine inside of Docker, uh, inside my Mac. And what I'm doing with the 80 to 80 is just saying turn on the external port 80 to my internal port 80. So that was just a mapping of uh, the port. Uh, somebody asked a question about tools for managing private corporate images like Artifactory. So that is our Docker Trusted Registry solution, which is part of Docker Enterprise Edition. So as I mentioned, um, that is something you would install uh, in your own environment. So if you're looking for a hosted version, we do have Docker Cloud, uh, which is a hosted version. But um, Docker Trusted Registry typically is something that an IT team would, would manage and operate, set the policies, set the RBAC, L AD integration, LDAP integration, et cetera. Is there any way to access the host OS file system? I want to put security scan container, let's get the host file system. I am not sure on that one. I'll have to get back to you. Um, and I'll try to address that offline. So Ty, I will try to address that offline. Are all the UCV managers active at the same time? Yes. So all the managers um, run uh, replicas of each other so that <clears throat> if any node fails, the other nodes still carry all the uh, cluster information. Um, are containers secure since they run on the same OS? So that is the, the basic Linux container concept of, of um, separation and isolation of the processes. So um, I am not a deep, deep, deep Linux expert, but it leverages things like C-groups uh, to isolate processes so that a container itself cannot uh, basically look inside another container. Um, are there guidelines on how many managers there should be based on number of worker nodes? <clears throat> and that's kind of, yes, uh, and it will depend on your, your own environment needs and something you could work with our uh, solution architects on. It, it basically, it's like if you're running your entire uh, container environment in a single cluster versus in several different clusters, you might have different answer there. And Jen, you probably have time for about one more. Uh, I know there's a lot rolling in. We had a big crowd today, um, so we might have to take some of these offline or in a blog, but you probably have question, uh, time for about one, more, one or two more questions. Okay, let me kind of scan. Um, so a little bit on the difference between the Enterprise Edition, Basic Standard, and Advanced. So again, um, I know if you wanted to move up into those other editions, um, the hosted environment will be a great tool for you to, to play with it and understand it before you make a purchasing decision. And uh, yes, I think that's the last one I can get to. <laughs> So what we'll do is uh, after the webinar, everyone will get a copy of the slides and we will post the recording. Um, and what uh, we typically do as well is um, we will do a quick Q&A blog post with all of your different questions there. So keep an eye out on the Docker blog for that information as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today. This does conclude the webinar. And um, as Jenny said, the session was recorded and a copy will be sent out to you in the next few days. And please be sure to register for upcoming Docker webinars at docker.com slash webinars. And also check out docker.com slash events um, for upcoming events that we have taking place. Um, thank you again for joining us and we hope you have a great day.